It's all on the line in Kansas City tonight. Texas and Xavier battling for an Elite Eight berth. We have you covered from all angles of tonight's game. Coming up on the 1-0 Sports Show. Texas finally 1-0, finally riding for the brand. And I'm getting back on my soapbox oh, and no. saying that if they just hit and wrap <laughs> and drive, then that play doesn't happen. You heard it here first from Hunter. Book your plane tickets to Omaha today. <laughs> but we're not done yet. No, no, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, well, that's the third time. Three. That's terrible. Did you believe this was possible at the beginning of the season? Oh, I always believe. Uh, <laughs> always drink the Kool Aid. Welcome into the 1 0 Sports Show. I'm Adam Ogburn, joined alongside by Robert Gonsolin. Robert, how are you doing this morning? Doing well, I'm happy to be here on the set. Yeah, we've got a stacked show today. It's March. It's, it's the best time of the year. So much sports going on. Sweet 16. Yep. Right. Just riding the full swing of things. Texas is playing tonight. Yeah, huge game. We got four last night. We'll get four more tonight. The women's Sweet 16 kicks off today. It is a loaded uh, slate of basketball. But we've got to start this one on sports show. Before we jump into everything, Texas Xavier, we've got to start it like we always do. And that's with who's hot and who's not. So, Robert, let's start with you. Who's hot for you this week? Dude, I have to start with our very own Dylan DeSue. 28 points against Penn State, 70% from shooting from field goals off of 16 rebounds. He's actually like playing very well, averaging 9.1 points per game. If Texas really wants to get off to a great start tonight over Xavier, definitely start feeding it down low to Dylan DeSue. Yeah, I agree, Robert. I think, honestly, Dylan DeSue is the only reason they won that Penn State game. The, the threes weren't falling. I think the Horns only made one three-pointer in that game. So Dylan DeSue, I think he dropped 28 points against Penn State. Having a legit big man like that that can score, that really pushes Texas, I think, in the national title conversation. Oh, I agree. And when I really think that Texas went down by four near just a couple minutes mm -hmm. left in the game against uh, Penn State, it, it just became the DeSue show. He just was scored. He, he went like about eight for eight yeah. off, off of shooting right after that point, about, or six for six. But he was on fire. Definitely wanted to uh, use him tonight if I were the Longhorns. Yeah, Texas is going to probably need another big game out of him against Xavier. I'm going to stay in March Madness uh, for my who's hot. And my who's hot is Tobin Anderson, the new coach at Iona. What a whirlwind for him. So nine days ago on Wednesday, his Fairleigh Dickinson team was facing Texas Southern. Then seven days ago, they knock off Purdue. And then by early this week, he's already hired as the new head coach at Iona uh, after Rick Pitino left to take the job at St. John's. How about that parlaying in a 10-day period? You essentially go from a first four coach that no one has ever heard of, who, who was a D2 coach a year ago, and now he's got a five-year deal at Iona, and his fairly Dickinson team has gone down history uh, with one of the biggest upsets in March Madness. If you can really show that you can perform well on the big stage, you know, opportunities open up. We saw the... Uh, that pitcher from Nicaragua get a contract yeah. in the World Baseball Classic, and now we have Tobin Anderson, you know, just doing super well uh, in the tournament, getting a getting a, a full time contract at a, a yeah. much bigger school. But I mean, this this man, he he was coaching D two and yep. D three, right? Yep, yeah. nine nine years as a D two coach. You know, people told him he wouldn't make it back up to D one unless he went back and was a D one assistant. He proved them wrong and is certainly uh, succeeding now. So we talked about some good. Now let's talk about some bad. Robert, who's not hot for you right now? I have to go with Purdue men's basketball. You know, over the past three seasons, even though they went to the Sweet 16 last year, they've been losing to very high seeds. You know, obviously, going back to the Fairleigh Dickinson loss, lost to a 16 seed, only the second team in history to do that if you're a one seed. Last year, 15 seed St. Peter's losing to them in the Sweet 16. 2021, losing to 13 seed North Texas. I know that, you know, go, especially like focusing on the Sweet 16 loss to St. Peter's, I know like you're going to the third round of the tournament and that's great. Not many teams at all mm -hmm. actually have to do that. But imagine like, what are the what ifs here? What if you didn't lose to a 15? 15 yeah. seed in the Sweet 16 or a 16 seed in the first round, which, like, never happened other than UMBC in 2018. But, like, how far could have Purdue gone in these past three seasons if these matchups uh, didn't happen or if they overcame, if overcame these 
other teams. Yeah, I think you look at last year, especially with they still had Zach Eady, but they had Jaden Ivey who could shoot lights out. St. Peter's uh, eliminated in that round. The North Carolina went on to blow out St. Peter's in the Elite Eight. So definitely a lot of what ifs there. Uh, Matt Painter, he's got to get figured out in the postseason for the Boilermakers. Can't can't keep having these early exits. Uh, my who's not, we've got the uh, NBA refs. Uh, what's going on in the Mavs Warriors game was the question of the day a couple days ago. Uh, if we can get the VO rolling. So here it is. Look at this. Easy bucket for the Warriors. This would be the difference. The Warriors only win this game by two, but Mark Cuban pointed out, if you look at the still frame, I believe there are only two referees in the front courts. There's another referee in the back court who's maybe thinking it's Mavericks ball. That's what Mark Cuban said. He said basically the Mavericks thought it was their ball. The referees changed the call, and apparently that wasn't relayed uh, to the Mavericks. I don't care, even if it was worse ball, even if that's the right call, it's just not a good look for anyone. You feel like a good referee would get that straightened out before just handing the ball in. I feel like, yeah, referees shouldn't let that happen. They all need to be on the same page and let both teams know, make sure they know what's going on on the court at all times. I mean, clearly, if you look at the replay, you were saying the referee actually did point that it was Warriors ball mm -hmm. before heading into the timeout. But if you're going to change the call uh, coming out of it, you got to let both teams know so that, you know, scenarios like this where the Warriors are able to just easily score right under their own basket, like, doesn't happen. you got to make sure that, you know, all teams kind of know what's going on or there are going to be protests from, you know, people in the organization on both sides, like Mark Cuban. Yeah, because honestly, Robert, it, it reflects worse on the referee. Like, the referees are the people who come out looking the worst from this just because it looks like they haven't clearly communicated the team. So, right, no, I don't know. Sure. I just feel like as a referee, even even though the team should know whose ball it is, if there's mass confusion like that, I feel like you've got to fix it instead of just letting them play on because it's going to look bad bad for you. Because, uh, obviously, these guys are NBA players. They're not getting confused on what side of the court they're on. Obviously, there's some sort of miscommunication. Sure. It's one thing if you score on your own basket, but – that's what I was kind of like looking for when I, when I saw this clip. But, you know, it, it's another thing when the referees aren't on the same page and you're just, they're just letting the other team score on your own basket and you're not down there playing defense. Well, the Mavericks did file a protest on this game, so we'll have to see if anything else comes out of that bizarre incident that took place earlier this week. Now let's move on to what's trending. And, Robert, you mentioned this earlier. What's trending? How about those Sweet 16 games last night? A couple of barn burners had Kansas State edging Michigan State. How Florida Atlantic with a massive run and take down Tennessee, Arkansas uh, dispatched by UConn, and then lastly, the game of the night, Gonzaga and UCLA trading blows late. Robert, what was your reaction to last night's game? What stood out to you from that four-game slate? I, what stood out to me the most was just how fast and wild the, uh, the Gonzaga-UCLA UCLA game was. You know, at one point, you think UCLA scores late. Oh, they're going to win this game after Drew Timmy missed both free, thro free throws. But then here comes Gonzaga at the very end of the game, nails down the three-pointer to win it all. That was insane. It's, you know, it's one of those games where, like, it, basketball comes down to the last last few seconds. Mm -hmm. you know, it yeah. always does. And you're just like, okay, if you can score really late, it sounds like you may win the game. But, like, those, if there's one or two extra seconds on the clock, you never know what's going to happen, and that last night was definitely one of those games. I was also very impressed by the way Kansas State played yesterday. Yeah. That no-look alley-oop. People, if you didn't see this, there was a play where in the second half of the Kansas mm -hmm. State game where their point guard was talking to their coach, communicating with him mid-play, and people were like, was this was this fake? I mean, was this set up? Yeah. He's communi communi communicating with his coach mid-play, excuse me, and he throws a no-look alley-oop down to his forward under the basket mm -hmm. for a, a, a backwards dunk. Completely caught the other team off guard. Tom Izzo and Michigan State were not prepared for that, but I thought that was another top play. Yeah, I'm shocked. Tom Izzo, I thought, I thought that region would turn into Izzo ball that Michigan State was going to pat the Final Four. Definitely impressed by uh, Jerome Tang, Kansas State. Florida Atlantic repping for the mid-majors. Not as shocked by that one. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that Tennessee got to the Sweet 16. I thought for sure Duke was going to eliminate them. Just they've been kind of leaking oil down the stretch after uh, Zakai Zegler tore his ACL. Obviously, he was a key piece uh, for Tennessee that was probably one of the best teams in the country about two months ago. Um, but, yeah, that, that Gonzaga game is a uh, classic. Yeah, how about the guts on that uh, yeah. that shot by uh, Julian Strother? They were only down by one at that point, I believe. They didn't, one. They didn't need the three, but... He pulled up basically from Chris Jenkins' range. Remember that Villanova oh, shot yeah, from a couple of years ago? Yeah, probably six or seven years ago now. So, 
How about this, Zach? Should be interesting. We'll be, uh, we'll be picking those Elite Eight games here a little bit later on in the show. Definitely looking Forward forward to, to some great basketball on Saturday. Uh, now, let's talk about the women. We were hoping that they would be playing this weekend, but unfortunately, they met their match, Louisville, dismantling the Longhorns at home uh, on Monday this week, 73-51. to I mean, Robert, what went wrong for the Longhorns in that game? I think that Louisville... In terms of just what went wrong, I feel like Texas wasn't really as able to keep up with Louisville that much. They played really fast. There were many plays where Louisville was able to just run down the, push it down the court and mm -hmm. hit Texas with a lot of pump fakes and then uh, get more like easier inside the arc shots. Also, Haley Van Lith played really well, and Texas kind of had a hard time stopping her. She had 21 points, was 21 points and was definitely running, being the floor general the entire night. You know, it was just more of... Could could Texas stop Louisville's momentum? And I don't think that. I mean, in the end of the at the end of the day, they weren't able to do that. They had one point in the third quarter. They got it down to I think nine points. It was either nine or eleven, and then they tried to throw like a full court length uh, pass, and they threw it out of bounds. And that was pretty much it. They got a little bit of momentum, but like you said, this was Louisville. Couldn't slow Haley Van Lith down. Texas could not finish in the bucket either. They had a bunch of missed layups, bust, bunch of missed opportunities in the paint. Louisville was the much better team in the paint, and I think that was pretty much the, the, the difference in the game right there. So disappointing loss uh, for the Longhorns. One thing I do think, Robert, we need to keep an eye on is effort was a t uh, and toughness was a key issue for this Longhorn team throughout the year. Vic Schaefer talked about it in several press conferences after losses. So you hope that's not a bigger problem for the program. I think that's something, definitely something that Vic will be focusing on this offseason. Definitely have to tip our hats to the uh, seniors who won't be here next year. Rory Harmon, great player. You know, she definitely led the team throughout the entire season. And I believe Shaley Gonzalez will be gone as well. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I think uh, Sonia Morris. Shaylee Gonzalez is a senior. I believe she has an option to return because of the COVID year. So we got, we got to look at the COVID years. These players are uh, allowed to come back. Eligibility gets a little, sh you know, uh, not really sure if, if they can come back or yeah. they can't. But. I know Son Sonia Morris, I think she'll be the biggest graduate and uh, remains to be seen if uh, Shaylee Gonzalez uh, takes that COVID year. Uh, last one. This was on Tuesday. This was honestly, Robert, I felt like this was a little bit buried in March Madness. Probably talk about this here in just a second. But the World Baseball Classic Final, uh, it was a very close game. Japan edging the U.S. 3-2. to two. Robert, in your eyes, do you think the World Baseball Classic was a success? Obviously, all the MLB guys getting to play in it oh, this time. Oh, for sure. I think this place, I mean, this event was really cool, especially because you watch the MLB throughout the entire summer and uh, early spring, and you see a bunch of, you know, the best American players and a bunch of foreign players on, on other teams who are also really good. And then you get to see them all come together and rep their own home nation, but you're watching them all play at once, playing against each other, you know, all at one time. And baseball's a sport where you don't get to see the best pitchers play every day mm -hmm. because they got to rotate. You don't get to see the best batters hit every day because they, they take yeah. rests. This, this was like a shorter baseball event where, you know, they were all paired up against each other. Mexico's best players, Dominican Republic's best players, U.S.'s best players, Shohei Otani from Japan. You got to all see them go against each other and rep their own country on a smaller stage, which meant more all-stars were playing. Yeah, I, I liked it. The only thing, I wish it was just a little bit either earlier or if they did during the summer. I just feel like it got buried in March Madness. I think it would have been great maybe in late February instead of kind of in mid-March. I think that was my only regret. I just feel like a lot of a lot of the big stories kind of got buried under kind of with America fixating on March Madness for kind of this two-week period. But I think it's a huge success. I did see, I believe there are 47 games in the World Baseball Classic. And I think the attendance at those 47 games actually was more attendance than six major league teams had all last season wow. based on a statistic I had. So people loved it. Um, you hope. Uh, I know, I think it was Edwin Diaz who did get hurt for Puerto Rico. He hurt his knee and it's going to be out for the season. You hope injuries like that don't discourage MLB guys from playing in this again because like you said, it's, it's huge because guys are getting to rep their own countries and there's just something I think too for fans when, when you get to kind of have that country pride, that national uh, pride getting to root on your country they think is really special, especially when all the best players in the world are representing their own countries. But Spring training is going on at the exact same time that the World Baseball Classic is. And, you know, for those uh, 32 professional MLB managers, how do you think that they like, how do you think they like the whole idea of, 
you know, their best players going off to not practice with them during spring yeah. training and playing for their own country. Yes, like playing for your own country and repping them, that's awesome. But then you're kind of staying away from the team as you're getting ready for the whole entire season. I mean, that's what spring training is for. How do you mm. think those coaches, you know, do you think they like it? Do you think they're okay with it? What do you think? I would guess I would guess they tolerate it. I think one nice thing about baseball and is it's not as much – um, I think outside maybe pitchers and catchers is not as much of a team chemistry sport. It's not like basketball or football where right. you need the whole team to run a play. So I think the, the fact that these guys are getting meaningful reps means they will come back to their teams fresh. But I think obviously as a manager, I'm sure you want all your teams kind of all your team kind of under one umbrella. But I, right. I think I think they're probably okay with it. Do they love it? No. But I think they respect these guys going to represent their countries. I think the only time they they really would not like it is if you get a guy coming back on the injured list like Edwin Diaz and now like Jose Altuve are. Right, as well, so, right. but uh, definitely something special. I, I hope it comes back, and maybe, uh, maybe they can shift it a week or two where it's not as buried under March oh, Madness. Sure. But I think the attendance numbers tell the story. Definitely a huge success. Well, that's going to do it for our first segment. But when we come back, Carter Yates, he's going to join the panel. He's going to help me and Robert break down the best plays of the week. You won't want to miss it when we return on the One and Another Sports Show. Welcome back into the One and Other Sports Show. Now joined by Carter Yates. Carter, how are you doing this morning? Hey, happy to be here on this Friday morning. Excited for the One and Other Sports Show. Let's get started. Yeah, 
Yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about with so much basketball, World Baseball Classic. We've got a lot of great highlights uh, we're going to run through. If you don't know how this portion of the show works, uh, it's a segment we call Versus. Robert and I have each brought a highlight that we think best fits the category. Carter's going to pick the one that he thinks is the winner uh, for that category for the given week. So let's get started with the best uh, men's basketball play for March Madness so far. Robert, over to you. I got to go with Julian Strother's uh, late Three-point game winner from Gonzaga over the UCLA last night. Put the ball up the lead. Pulls up the lead and passes it. Bulldogs would go up by two. It's kind of the exact same play that Villanova ran yep. in 2016 over North Carolina in the final. Look at that. From the logo, Julian Strother, what a player. But I, that, that just play just gave me a lot of excitement. I got to go with that one. Yeah, that was incredible, especially, I can't believe that was the play called down by one with eight seconds left. Let's, let's bomb the three from the logo, but I guess uh, Mark Few has been liking what he's seen out of Strother in practice. Uh, I'm going to go with another deep three. This was back in the first round. Uh, Virginia, going to Virginia uh, on this high. Let's take a look at it here. Uh, Kate Clark, stuck in the corner, throws it away, but it's not about that. It's about J.P. McGee. Look at this. For the winner for Furman, Furman hadn't been in the tournament since 1980, but they get their moment in the spotlight right here. Here's the shot again. Pagui with the game-winning three-pointer to send the Paladins through to the round of 32. So two game-winning three-pointers. Carter, which one do you think is the best one so far? Well, I got to go with Robert's pick here and Julian Strother because you got to talk about the stones you need to have to hit a logo three with seven seconds left. What we don't talk about is, hey, what if he misses that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now there's still a lot of time left on the clock, but a beautiful play execution with the trailer. Uh, UCLA's defense not expecting that whatsoever. I think, Adam, your highlight's great, too, but a lot of that's attributed to Virginia being sloppy on their press yeah. break. So, great individual effort there by Julian Strother. i got to go with Robert here. Last couple of years, Tony Bennett and March have not been a good combination uh, up in Virginia. Uh, we talked about the men's. Now let's flip over the women's. Their Sweet 16 kicks off today. So, the best uh, women's basketball play from the first two rounds so far. Robert, what you got? i got to head in the first round and go with Princeton's game winner, over NC State. Here's Grace Stone right here at near the end of the game, going to the baseline, cashing it in for three to go up by one point with just four seconds left. Grace Stone, Princeton, they're doing a great job right now, heading to the Sweet 16. Uh, and, you know, they're looking to go even further. But I got to go with this baseline three right here, you know, cashing it in just at the perfect time. That's what's kind of secured it for them. What a year for Princeton. Both their men's and women's team winning games uh, in the tournament, repping the Ivy League. I've got another game winner. The women's tournament's usually maybe a little bit more chalk. This year's been off the rails already. Two number one seeds are gone right now, and this is how one of them went down. How about uh, Destiny Harden here for Miami? Look at this. Inbound to Harden. Look, she's going to spin her defender and then put it in with just a second or, or three seconds remaining to knock off Indiana. This is a nine seed taking on a one seed. That's a massive upset to do that on Indiana's home court, send them out of the tournament. Destiny Harden in the clutch there for Miami. So two more game winners for you to sift through, Carter. Which one do you think is the best one so far? Hey, well, as much as the Princeton basketball program, both men's and women's have had great tournaments thus far, I got to go with Adam, your play right there. I mean, the degree of difficulty on the inbounds pass to throw a bounce pass in the middle of the paint and then a Euro, uh, not a Euro step, but a pump fake and spin around to knock off a number one seed. Again, women's bracket, like you said, so much chalk usually, but been a really exciting tournament with two number one seeds getting knocked off. Adam, I got to go with you here. She also made a really, really good move down low to kind of get that yeah. shot at the very end of the game. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, and I mean, the hardest part about that, the men's, it's obviously always neutral courts. They did that on Indiana's home court. Definitely impressive from Miami's uh, women. Miami also, that's another team with both teams in the Sweet 16. How about those Hurricanes? Uh, let's go to uh, the best NBA play uh, from the week. Robert, what you got for us? I got to go with this super exciting play that we no one saw coming out of anywhere. Paul George's 360 dunk. Boom. Defense gets right out of the way. That's something I haven't seen in about seven, eight years. He did a 360 in a game on a fast break just years ago. But, you know, it's kind of making you think that's not vintage Paul George because I think Paul George still has a lot of gas in him, obviously. But, you know, 
I didn't think he'd be able to, he'd be capable of pulling some off something like that as he was about seven years ago when he had that first 360 dunk. Yeah, the Thunder did not want anything to do with that dunk. They just they got out of the way. Right out of the way. Uh, let's go. Uh, I've got another dunk for us. How about uh, Donovan Mitchell right here? Uh, he's going to put Yudo Watanabe on a poster. Look at this fast break. Ball comes to Mitchell, and poor Watanabe gets absolutely posterized. A uh, slow motion replay. It doesn't make it any better uh, for yeah, Watanabe. I don't think he wants to see that one again. So, two uh, two dunks uh, from two of the NBA's best players. Uh, Carter, which one was better? Well, two great dunks, and I think no nothing on Paul George here. But Adam, I got to go with you and Donovan Mitchell because the defender didn't get out of the way. He tried to jump up and block that shot, and I just am a sucker for a good poster as opposed to the Houston Rockets. Hey, let me get out of the way real quick and let Paul yeah. George do his thing. So I'm gonna go with Donovan Mitchell on this one. Well, Robert, I think we've talked about a lot of good. I think it's time for the blooper of the week. So what's your blooper of the week? So I'm going to revisit the Dallas Mavericks Golden State Warriors incident. I know that people are blaming it on the refs. Some people are going to be blaming it on the Mavericks. I think the whole incident as an as a entire just entity is a blooper in itself. Well, let's here's go the, here are the Dallas minute. Mavericks here. Dallas uh, letting the Warriors the score timeout. on their own basket not even being ready coming out of the timeout. I know there was miscommunication going on, but when do you ever see this in an NBA game? Just complete miscommunication from all parties, the refs and the Mavericks as a whole. I got to go with that play. Yeah, that's just a whole mess. Like, I, I've never seen anything like that, not in a professional sports game. Uh, I came across this one. Uh, shout out the Sickos Committee on Twitter. Let's go to the European Cricket Series. Uh, this is uh, – we'll let this highlight speak to itself. So, it's a, it's a pretty good drive. I don't know a ton about cricket. It's, it's not this part. So the ball – I guess it's part of the blue, but the ball goes through the defender's legs. But he's going to recover. He's going to throw it back, and then look what happens next. That, that one is going to hurt. That one's painful. Trying to walk it off. Watch the commentators. Though. Watch their reaction to it. They can barely uh, hold themselves back. <laughs> so uh, a, a tough day uh, on the European cricket series for that one cricket player. Looked like a great hit, but then he significantly paid for it a couple seconds later. Oh. Carter, Carter, some crazy moments. What's your worst blooper of the week out of that? As much as I love the creativity going to the European Cricket League <laughs> and a groin shot always <laughs> plays, in my opinion. <laughs> The blooper with the NBA, I mean, the, the amount of people that had to be a part of that, and you talk about for the NBA, it's a nationally televised mm -hmm. game, between two teams that are vying for playoff contention right now, between two of Luka Doncic and Steph Curry, the two game's biggest stars, now Mark Cuban having to file a protest after that. I don't think you get much bigger of a blooper on a national stage for the NBA. Robert, i got to go with you on this one. Doesn't happen often at all. Yeah, for sure. Well, that makes it two to two. So it all comes down to this. And we, we talked about the great success the World Baseball Classic was earlier. Now it's time for us to each bring our best play uh, from the tournament. Robert, what you got? Okay, so I got to go with the uh, Panama taking on Chinese Taipei. Here's minor leaguer Luis Castillo. No, not the pitcher from the Seattle Mariners, but outfielder. Check out this grab he makes as he runs into his own teammate but hangs on to the ball. Oh. Very rough collision. That did not look like it, uh, it felt good. Very painful right there. But look at him. Hangs on. Gets all four limbs in the air and just maintains the out. And, you know, Panama would go on to win that game. But what a catch by Luis Castillo. You got to wonder who's calling. I guess they're both calling for the ball there. Like, some, something wasn't right on the communication. Normally, normally center fielder has right away on that ball, so I don't know. I mean, he made the catch, but <laughs> yeah. he should have gone away from the center fielder. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go uh, with Nicar Nicaragua. Uh, how about Duque A. Bear? We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier. Look at this against Dominican Republic. This guy, he's going to strike out first Juan Soto, then Julio Rodriguez, and then he's going to finish the inning out with Rafael Devers. But then the story gets better after this. Uh, he gets signed by a minor league contract by the Tigers. How about that? So a guy who was previously unknown to Major League Baseball goes and strikes out three of the biggest stars, puts his name on the map for Nicaragua. That's got to be my best moment from the World Baseball Classic. You don't get to see David versus Goliath like that too much. So, Carter, what, what you got from it? Well, I got to agree with you, Adam. I'm, I love a good David versus Goliath story. And, you know, that's what the World Baseball Classic is about, is these guys getting a chance to showcase themselves on probably the biggest stage of their life. And he took advantage of his moment. 
now parlaying that into a minor league contract with an MLB team. So that's my best moment, I think. I'm going to vote for that one. Well, Robert, that was, that was a lot of fun. We had a lot of good highlights to choose from. It's been a stacked month of sports. Great week, too. Great yeah. week. And a great weekend upcoming. We've got, we got two rounds of women's Sweet 16, um, and then we got the men's Elite Eight coming up, too. So it's going to be a jam-packed weekend of sports. Carter, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't fear, though, because Carter is going to be back uh, for the guest picks. Uh, he's going to help us uh, break down what's going to happen for the rest of uh, men's and women's March Madness. But when we come back, I got the chance to speak earlier with Brad Dobney. He's a journalist with the Banners on the Parkway site. That's Xavier's uh, SB Nation basketball site. He gave me the insight on the Musketeer basketball team ahead of tonight's game. We'll have that interview. We're going to return on the One and O Sports Show. Welcome back into the One and Oh Sports Show. We've got a treat joining us all the way from Ohio. Uh, it's Brad Dobney who helps to run uh, Xavier's SB Nation banners on the Parkway site, giving us insight to tonight's big game. Brad, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Like you said, I'm up in Ohio, so that means here in Northeast Ohio, it's 50 degrees and raining and will be for the next month. Dang, man. Well, Texas, it's already 85 down here, so our winter is almost pretty much long gone, but a big game tonight. The two versus the three seed highly anticipated winner will take on Houston, Miami. Brad, but before we get into kind of talking about the matchup, let's uh, kind of rewind a little bit. Uh, can you kind of tell us a little bit about Xavier? You know, how's this year kind of gone in comparison to what the expecta expectations were for the Musketeers back in the fall? I think it was kind of hard to set expectations for Xavier this year um, with the roster having gone through a little bit of flux and Sean Miller coming back to the team, um, it was hard to really know uh, what was going to happen. Xavier had been out of the tournament for four years um, after being a perennial Sweet 16 before, team before that. Uh, you know, Sean Miller came back kind of not in the best of circumstances until uh, that report came out uh, this year that, that shed a little bit better light on it. So it's hard to know what expectations were. Uh, Xavier got off to a really good start um, and was doing really well in the Big East. Then Zach Fremantle got hurt. Um, and that kind of changed things. Thankfully, uh, Sean Miller, uh, regardless of what your opinion is of him on other things, is a great basketball coach. Uh, Xavier chopped and changed on the fly, uh, had a little bit of a stumble near the end of the Big East, but then got rolling again 
uh, through the tournament. And if they hadn't had to play three games in three days, I think we're really giving them Marquette a run in the Big East tournament. And now here we are again in the Sweet 16, uh, just like we were the year before Sean Miller left. Yeah, for sure. And But, I mean, honestly, I think probably most of Xavier fans will admit this. It was very, very close to a first-round exit against Kennesaw State. They really gave the Musketeers all they could handle. But y'all bounced back with a nice win over Pitt. Can you just kind of talk a little bit about what you felt kind of went wrong for Xavier against Kennesaw State and then what kind of improvements you saw against Pitt two days later? Uh, it really comes down to quick guards. Um, Xavier has Adam Kunkel and Sule Boom in the backcourt. Uh, Colby Jones kind of plays a swing three, uh, so he's a guard-forward combo. But Boom and Kunkel are very good on offense and not what you would call uh, stoppers on defense. Uh, Kennesaw State really attacked off the dribble and tried to get downhill towards the rim. That caused Xavier a lot of trouble. Pitt, uh, for one, doesn't have guards quite as quick, and for two, is a little more content to shoot jump shots, uh, and that plays into Xavier's hand. Also, Kunkel got red hot uh, against Pitt and hit his first five three-pointers. Um, when he gets going, his range is about 30 feet, it seems like, and he thinks it's 40 feet. Um, so he's He's willing to shoot any time, any place. Uh, once he got hot against Pitt, that kind of put Pitt in a hole they couldn't crawl out of. Yeah, that Kennesaw State game, a lot of stress eating near the end of that one. <laughs> That's for sure. But, hey, you guys survived. It's better than teams like Arizona and Purdue can say. And now, uh, Xavier here in the Sweet 16. Talking about that, I believe it's Xavier's first Sweet 16 since the 2016-17 season. So, Brad, can you kind of talk a little bit about kind of how's the mood kind of from fans surrounding this Xavier program heading into this game? Is there a lot of confidence or kind of what's the feeling uh, around Xavier ahead of tonight's matchup? So, yeah, it, the feeling around Xavier changed March 19th of last year, and that's when Sean Miller came back. Um, he was always a fan favorite here. Uh, he was a fan favorite at Pitt, who we just knocked out as well. Um, I'm sure you've seen the send it in Jerome clip. Sean Miller's the guy who throws that pass. Um, so he's well known at Pitt. The mood, I, I wouldn't want to call it house money, but people are just excited to be back in the tournament, which is a lot. Xavier fans kind of thought of this as our birthright. Um, and then we had kind of that down stretch. Things didn't go as well. So to be back here has been exciting. But I, you know as well as I do, once you get to the Sweet 16, everybody's kind of casting that eye ahead. And yeah, you're happy to be here, but you're two games away from the promised land and everybody's looking to that. So uh, the mood's excited. Um, I know a lot of people made the drive out here over the last two days to Kansas City. Um, there was a lot of complaining about the fact that I-70's closed down. There's a lot of Xavier fans. Xavier always travels well. Um, if if Xavier's in this game or ahead late, you'll hear that Let's Go X chant coming through the TV. Fingers crossed. Should be a great atmosphere. And now I'm going to kind of jump back to a player you mentioned earlier, Sule Boom. Obviously a cool story for him. He actually played under Texas interim head coach, Rodney Terry at UTEP. So, uh, Brad, can you just kind of talk a little bit about, obviously, he came in uh, from UTEP this season. How big of a player has Suley Boom been for y'all's Musketeers, and kind of uh, how big of a game do you think this is for him tomorrow? Uh, I think it's a huge game for him. Uh, you know, this is his last college season. He uh, is a little more active on Twitter than a lot of guys are during the season. He had some really nice things to say about Rodney Terry and his time at UTEP yesterday, talking about how uh, – you know, just because he transferred doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't feel like he's part of the fabric around there and has a really good relationship with Terry. Um, I think he's excited about this game. I know his mom is going to try to get to this one. She'd never seen him play in the tournament before, and then she ended up sleeping in a Dallas airport and missing the Kennesaw State game. So it's a good thing that we won that uh, so Sule's mom could get to the, uh, the game against Pitt. Uh, he is a big part of what Xavier does. Um, He's electric with the ball. He can get downhill off of either hand. Um, he'll handle the ball most of the time for the Musketeers. He's a great three-point shooter. He's been having the same three-point shooting problems that the entire tournament has been since they switched to this Wilson ball. I'm sure you saw Mark Few's comments about that yesterday. Um, shots haven't been going down for him. He started stone cold. He was one for his first nine against Pitt before he kind of warmed into the game. But then he did, and he can score in bunches, and he put in 14 in the second half. So, a lot of what Xavier does keys off of boom, but he's patient. He'll get the guys with the hot hand, the ball, um, and he'll wait for his time. If Texas goes to that high uh, switch off of the ball screen, he'll attack that. And that's when he really can get into good pitch, 
pick and uh, pops it up with Jack Nungy, who shoots the three really well for a big man. For sure. You, you've mentioned a couple of, of players there, Nungy, Boom. You know, are there a couple, you know, who are some other Xavier players that you think Texas is going to have to keep an eye on uh, tomorrow night or tonight? Uh, Jer- Jerome Hunter is playing the best basketball of his life right now. He had a career high 24 against Kennesaw State. Um, he said after the game that he's just not ready to be done playing yet. Um, last year, he was, let's call him a polarizing figure in the Xavier fan base. He shot a whole bunch of threes, and he shot them at 21% clip. Um, this year, he shot seven. Sean Miller's got him down in the post, and he is he's strong. He's relentless on the offensive glass. He's Xavier's best uh, rebounder now that Fremantle's out. He'll get after everything. He's a high-energy player. Um, I think he's one of the guys that could cause Texas some issue in there because he's athletic and he's really strong. Um, I talked about Kunkel a little bit. He's going to shoot the ball. Um, he always thinks he's open, and he always thinks he's hot. The dude has no conscience. He's a blast to watch play. Um, Jack Nungy, uh, you know what he can do. Coming off the bench, uh, Xavier's thin. Uh, they got Cesar Edwards, who will spot the big men. Um, he'll play maybe five to ten minutes. Um, it appears that his goal when he gets on the floor is to foul as many people as quickly as possible. So that's always fun to watch how many different people he can slap. Um, and then they got a really good freshman guard named Des Claude, who's uh, excellent getting to the rim, can shoot the three pretty well. He shot 42% in Big East play. Uh, he occasionally has turnover problems. He was only 5 of 10 from the line against Pitt. Um, late in the game, Pitt's plan became to just uh, hack Claude, send him to the line, and start making up ground, and that worked really well. So in a close game, uh, that'd be something to watch as well. But, you know, I've mentioned seven guys, and that's as deep as Xavier goes. There will not be an eighth Xavier player on the floor today. Yeah, for sure. And now kind of getting a head-to-head matchup, kind of what's a key for Xavier to victory, and then what's a weakness for Xavier that you think Texas can take advantage of uh, heading into tonight's game? Uh, a key for Xavier to victory is keeping Texas's guards from getting all the way to the rim. Um, that was the problem against Kennesaw State is that Terrell Burden likes to get to the rim, and he did that really well. Um, if you look at hoopmath.com, though, uh, between Hunter Carr and Rice for Texas, they don't get all the way to the rim as much. About 22.6% of their shots come at the rim. Um, if Xavier can force them to pull up, uh, if, if Boom and Kunkel can uh, channel whatever senior magic they need it is to stay in front of somebody tonight um, and make them pull up, I think that's a key to victory for Xavier because when other teams' guards start to get into the lane, that can both lead to foul trouble for Nunji and Hunter. Um, which we're not deep enough to combat, and it can put the defense in rotation and then leave open three-pointers on the backside. Um, A weakness is turnovers. Texas forces a lot, and Xavier turns the ball over. Um, For a senior-laden team, Xavier turns the ball over in some really goofy ways. Um, You'll see the occasional pass that Sean Miller will catch. Uh, Colby Jones dribbled the ball off of his foot last game. Uh, Just weird things seem to happen, and Xavier's turnover rate can spike pretty quickly. Um, that's a thing that has me really, really concerned about this game is how hard Texas pressures the ball and also the multiple presses and half-court traps that they throw at them. Um, I think Rodney Terry is doing a great job with this team. Yeah, definitely should be a good matchup. Final question. This one's for all the marbles. What's your prediction for tonight's game? How do you think it goes down? Uh, <laughs> so the problem with this – I'm um, trying to maintain some level of journalistic integrity and having been a Xavier fan literally since the moment I was born is that um, I can't maintain any journalistic integrity here. Um, I'm going to pick Xavier 71 to 68. I think, like you said, this is going to be a great matchup. Um, Rodney Terry, like I just said, has been doing a really good job with this Texas team, but I think he's running into one of the five best coaches in the nation here. Sean Miller always has a plan and always has something up his sleeve. I think that the combination of Miller on the bench and Sule Boom, Adam Kunkel, and Jack Nungy not wanting this to be the end of the road will give Xavier just enough. Um, I think Xavier's three-point shooting will get them over the edge here. I'm hoping they can keep the turnovers limited and keep the Texas guards out of the lane, but I'm going to go Xavier in a really close one to set up a matchup with, I hope, my well, I actually hope like, you know, Houston Baptist or something somehow sneaks in there instead of actual Houston, but uh, that Elite game, Eight game we'll deal with when we get to it. Yeah, for sure. And Jim Laranaga at Miami, he's been working some March Madness, uh, March Magic these past couple of years, pulling off some upsets. So who knows who will be awaiting the winner uh, in the Elite Eight. But I think one thing's for sure, this should be a fantastic nightcap tonight in Kansas City. 
between the Longhorns and the Musketeers. Brad, thank you so much, so much for joining us this morning. And it's my pleasure, Adam. When we come back, we've heard about Xavier. Now we'll get Texas's point of view. Our Ryan Swankowski and Edley Termillion were at Texas Basketball Media Days this past week, and they got a chance to talk to some of Texas' stars one-on-ones. We'll have those interviews. Will we return on the 1-0 Sports Show? <laughs> Welcome back into the one and O sports show. Robert, we had the chance to hear about Xavier there. Now I think it's time to hear about the Longhorns. We were actually lucky enough, our Ryan Swankowski and Edley Termillion, they were out at Texas uh, basketball media availability uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. They got a chance to sit down with several key Longhorn players one-on-one. Here are those interviews, starting with Brock Cunningham, talking about what made this season so special. Can, can you tell me this? Are you still on the phone? Uh, can you mute us? Welcome back. <laughs> Incredible feat of live TV there. We were having some uh, technical difficulties uh, with the Texas men's basketball uh, interviews. We'll hopefully have those uh, for you here in just a moment, Robert, before we hopefully get those rolling. Uh, who's a player that you're looking for tonight to come up in a big way for the Longhorns? I know Dylan Dessu was the big man last game, but I got to go with Marcus Carr. 15.8 points per game and 42% from the field. He's just been a great floor general all season, and he's been a great pickup from uh, Minnesota. I know we, we've known that all year long, but, you know, the way he's just been able to command the floor and get to everyone who needs the ball and find open shots, I think that that's the guy who I'm most excited to look forward to tonight. Let's let's make this the Marcus Carr show. Yeah, I think one, one player I'm going to look at, Marcus Carr. I got like a Sir Jabari Rice. I think three-point shooter could be big. You talked to – we uh, heard Brad talk about a lot about the key uh, of Sully Boom and, and of Kunkel, too, who are, who are really good three-point shooters. Boom obviously been struggling a little bit, but I think the Horns are going to need some three-pointers and big moments tonight. Jabari Rice lights out against Colgate. But he struggled against Penn State. It'll be interesting to see uh, if he can get that uh, back on track uh, tonight. Wouldn't it be great if just our, all our players like Serge Barry Rice, Dylan Sue, they didn't like switch off and have like uh, great games. Like they didn't alternate and having great games. They all just came firing and everyone just had a great game. And the, you know, th this is a two take, two taking on a three seed. You think this is going to be close? But yeah. Everyone just came out firing on all cylinders, and Texas runs away with about ten or twelve points at the beginning of the game. That that would just be kind of 
I'd be surprised to see that, but that would be awesome to see. This is a Xavier team that looked a little bit susceptible against Kennesaw State. But then they came back and responded in a big way against Pitt. So it'll be interesting to see what we get out of the Musketeers. Uh, they kind of had an up and down year, but this is obviously a very talented basketball team, like you said, Robert. 3 2 matchup. It's probably going to be like Gonzaga UCLA, where it's probably going to go down to the wire tonight. I think it's going to be a toss up. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break on the 1 0 Sports Show. When we come back, we're going to hopefully have audio running on those interviews. And then we'll also have Carter back with us and we'll run through uh, the pick 'em. So that's all coming up in our last segment. We apologize for the technical difficulties, but that's live TV. We'll get you ready for the whole weekend of March Madness when we come back.
Welcome back into the 1 0 Sports Show. Apologize for technical difficulties, Buckley. Our technical wizard and master control, Samantha Pearl, helping us get everything fixed and straight away. So, Robert, now we finally get to hear what Texas basketball yeah. players had to say. Uh, here we go. Let's toss it to Ryan Edley now. Uh, we're going to start off with Brock Cunningham talking about what's made this season so special. This year's been different than any other year, including COVID. I've had a lot of differences. And, you know, of course, we had the, the drama off the court that uh, took the spotlight for a while. But this year is different from others because of the team that we have. We're really, really connected. Like, it's a family, and I think it shows with how we've been playing. We live together, and we do legitimately everything together. The team is always together in one way or another. That's a huge part of our success. Uh, played 39 out of 40 minutes. Uh, how are you feeling after that and what has led you to kind of be have that endurance off season long and scoring double digit points? It seems like almost consistently. What can you like, kind of attribute to that across the whole season? Uh, you know, really just the work that I put in the summertime uh, with my trainer, just trying to be in the best shape possible. Um, treating my body you know, the best I can, yeah. um, staying in the training room, eating the best I can to make sure that, you know, I'm staying durable throughout the season. And then right now it's March. I'll play yeah. every minute of the game, and, <laughs> you know, just trick myself into not thinking I'm tired at all just because, you know, it means that much. So um, maybe right after I might be a little tired, but I'm ready to do it again. Yeah, good to go. And I want to ask about your hair. Sometimes it's down, sometimes it's back. How do you decide? Me and my roommates were watching. You're like, what is, what is he doing with his hair today? <laughs> we, we never know. So tell me about the hair. Do you know when you're going to pull it down, pull it back? Nah, I never. Sometimes it's just a you know moment in the moment thing yeah. that day, uh, whatever <laughs> I'm gonna feel. But now it's getting pretty long, so yeah. I almost pretty much have to have it back all yeah. the time. Is this what you envision coming over from Iowa State with this kind of team and this kind of environment, making it to Sweet 16, maybe even further? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, my whole thing is winning. Honestly, I think a lot of people get caught up in points, stats, yeah. whatever. Um, coming to this team, I feel like I I, I brought a little sacrifice with it, with it, my scoring, whatever. Yeah. But I just want to do whatever to help the team, honestly. Uh, whether that I gotta have 10 assists, 11 assists, five points, yeah. or some nights it might be 15 points, whatever. It's really I'm not just going out every night thinking I'm just gonna have to score. Um, my main objective is to play defense, really, um, gotcha. without the other team's best player, honestly, yeah. um, to give us rhythm. Um, yeah. We got a lot of guys on the team that can get in rhythm like that, as you can yeah. see. So oh, yeah. I don't really trip off the other stuff. Gotcha. And first, want to ask you. You mentioned Vanderbilt, and I know that's in the past now, but is this kind of what you envisioned coming over from Vanderbilt? This kind of Sweet 16, potentially more kind of vibe. Um, yeah, I mean, I came here to play close to the family more and just have a chance of competing for championships, uh, the best possible chance. Um, so um, that was kind of what the plan was coming into the coming here or getting into the portal and then coming yeah. here. Um, so being able to you know play in the Sweet 16 was, was great. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm sure you've been asked a lot about Penn State. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about how many points you dropped or anything like that. But it seemed like on the screen, every time they showed you coming down the court, you had a smile on your face, whether it was – down when, when the 8-0 run, 10-0 run happened, always get the smile. Can you just talk about the, your joy for the game? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, if you ask anybody, I, I laugh and smile a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I try to keep it cool on the court, but sometimes I can't. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I just I just uh, like to smile. I think it makes life easier, to yeah. be honest. Um, and I've been told I have a good smile, so I try to, you know, show it as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. How do you guys keep going? What, I mean, what is what is the what is the secret to you guys' is our chemistry? relationships are real. That's that's all I can say is we love each other. We're a family. Um, this is as close of a team as I've ever been on for sure. Um, and just that that we have a common goal in mind and we all want to win championships. So I think just just the love we have for each other and our goals, um, nothing is going to stop us from doing accomplishing those. Um, you're one of the new guys on the team and everything like that. Um, you're a part of history. Sweet 16 since 15 years ago. Um, how do you feel about it to be part of history and everything like that? I mean, being a freshman, it's honestly a blessing. You know, it's my first year, and like, this is something I've always dreamed of. And now to be a part of it, like, that's anything you can wish for, and uh, you know, it's something that I've always wanted to be a part of. And now that I'm a part of it, like, I'm just trying to soak it in. That's the that's the biggest thing. Like, being with veteran players all over the team, like, they tell me to just soak soak it all in. Like, this is a once in a lifetime experience. Not a lot of players get to get to you know be a part of this and especially not a lot of freshmen get to be a part of this so being a freshman coming in and being on a great team that already gets to a sweet 16 and obviously we're not finished we, we try to go all the way but even to make history now and try to continue to make history as we go on and maybe get that final result of being a national championship for the first time you know at the university of texas men's basketball so i'm just trying to soak it all in man that's that's probably the biggest thing a lot of good, lot of good sound bites there from uh, Edley and Ryan out there at Texas Basketball uh, Media Day. 
Guys, I think one thing that I think these players kept echoing is the together this togetherness of this group, especially after all they've gone through this year. Uh, quick down the line, do we think Rodney Terry gets the head coaching job? Are we yes, no, or wait and see? Oh, I think for sure. I think he's gone above and beyond for the requirements to actually stay. I know, I know as an interim coach, it's hard to keep a job in no matter what sport it is uh, since you're taking over in the middle of the season. But he's definitely pushed it beyond the limit to where he's – He's playing for an elite eight spot mm -hmm. tonight. I mean, come on, this is a great team, and he's definitely like capitalizing on the players he's, he's he has. So yeah, yes, I think Rodney Terry, after having made the Sweet 16 last week, he'll be back next season. Texas has a great team this year, but the job Rodney Terry has done coming in mid-season, mm -hmm. not expecting to have to be a head coach this year. I think he's done more than enough to earn this job, and I think it's just after the tournament they're going to take the interim tag off. I agree. Players love him. Recruits, too. I think that's a big thing. He's had a really good uh, connections with some recruits, so I think I think Terry checks all the boxes. I think uh, the Longhorns need to go ahead and remove that interim tag after the tournament. All right, let's get into, we've got a lot of March Madness going on this week. Time to run through our pick -ums. and we'll start with tonight, 5.30 on TBS. Number one, Alabama taking on number five, San Diego State, trying to avoid the upset. Carter, who do you have in that one? Well, San Diego State's kind of had an easier tournament run thus far, playing College of Charleston and then Furman in the second around and I think Alabama even though Brandon Miller like might be still a little hampered with that injury Javon Quinterly's averaged 17.5 points per game in this tournament so he can pick up the slack give me Alabama in this one great pick Bama's looked in control they looked in control against Maryland the whole game I think they honestly look pretty much in control tonight I think Bama has a really nice path to the final right now with how the bracket's shaping up Robert I think Alabama's the most legit team in the entire tournament I know Brandon Miller is coming off of that in, uh, injury but I, I don't think that's going to affect him tonight. You know, 19.1 points per game. Alabama's also has an insane top 20 AP top 25 record. They I assume they have a lot of quad one quad one wins. I don't know how they're exactly calculated, but their resume from the entire season does prove that they're a legit team that is very tough to beat. I think Alabama is just going to take care of business tonight. Now, another number one, number five matchup. This one at 6.15 on CBS tonight. Houston looking to avoid the upset against the number five my seeded Miami Hurricanes. Robert, who do you have in that game? I think it's all going to come down to how Mar uh, Marcus Sasser is going to play. I know he also is dealing with an injury throughout the past couple games of the tournament. But I do believe U of H is a very talented team. I don't think they're as talented as Alabama. But U of H does need the respect and credit that they deserve. Marcus Sasser shows up tonight, also takes care of business. Uh, I think they win by about 11 points tonight. Oh, I think it's close to that. I think this one's going down to the wire. But I do like the Cougars of the one seed to just come out on top in this one. Jim Laranega, he's played, uh, he's shown his talent leading Miami. Uh, they knocked off number two seed Auburn last year on a deep run. Uh, they've gone through uh, number four Indiana and looked pretty dominant in that one. So I think they're going to have Houston run for the money. But I think Sasser and Jabal Shedd, uh, they have enough to hold off the Hurricanes. Yeah, and I'll give Houston the respect they deserve. They're number one in the country in field goal percentage on defense, what they're allowing the other team to get. But Miami, hitting 77% of their free throws, 56% of their two-point shots, and 36% of their three-point shots. And look, Houston seemed vulnerable in these first two games, especially going down by 10 to Auburn. It's all about the U for me. I'm taking Miami in this one. <laughs> big upset pick there. Another chance for a big upset right here. Number 15 seeded Princeton on another Cinderella run uh, for a 15 seed from New Jersey. Uh, they take on number six Creighton. Uh, number six seeded Creighton, that is. 8 o'clock TBS tonight. Carter, who do you have in that one? Well, the thing that worries me about Creighton is that they've had 11 bench points all tournament and they, they rely almost exclusively on their starting five. And Princeton, you know, we expected kind of a letdown game against Mizzou after they beat Arizona, and we got the exact opposite of that. I mean, Princeton came out and dominated Mizzou. I like Princeton Tigers to keep on rolling here in this one. That's a great pick. It's something about these 15 seeds from New Jersey. St. Peter's went to the Elite Eight. I think uh, Princeton can do it as well. They've shown Arizona was tall. They had three guys that are seven foot or more. Uh, Creighton's obviously got Colburn, who's a very talented player inside, but Princeton showed they can face a team with an elite big man by knocking off Arizona. I think they do it again tonight. There's something, something about the mid-majors in this tournament. Give me the Tigers and another upset. Robert, what do you think? I have to disagree with y'all. You know, I feel like the Cinderella slipper fits Princeton no longer. <laughs> I, I know that, you know, 
Princeton played very well against Arizona, and they can't really shoot the ball, but Colburn's a great player for Creighton. We've seen him play as Longhorn fans. We know what mm-hmm. Creighton can do. Creighton will take – well, Creighton will get it done tonight, but I just feel like, you know, Princeton's going to really have to battle to stay in this game. I think it will be down to the wire throughout the second half of – or the, the last part of the second half, but I think Creighton's going to begin to run away with it because Princeton's just going to be running out of gas near the end of the game. A big one now. Number two, Texas. Number three, Xavier. We've been previewing it all show. Time to pick it. Robert, who's winning that one tonight? Desu, Carr, Sir Javari Rice taking on a very powerful and sharp shooting Xavier team. We already, we've already talked mm-hmm. about uh, Boom from UTEP, right? Yep, the yeah, transfer. Yeah, they're going to really have to find ways to keep him contained throughout the game. But, you know, Texas has a lot of weapons. They can score the ball beyond the perimeter and inside the paint. They have great mid-range, too. Mid-range is crucial in the winning games. I have to go with the, with the Longhorns tonight. You know, Rodney Terry, he, he's done something so special with this team. He's picked up midway through the season. It's something just feels really special about it. Longhorns. I agree. Great pick. I think the emergence of Dylan DeSue is huge. Gives the Longhorns a reliable presence inside when those threes aren't falling. But those threes are going to have to fall better tonight than they did against Penn State. Can't get away with just one made three against this talented Xavier team. But I think Serge Jabari Rice, I think Marcus Carr, I think they have better games tonight. And so now this one's going down to the wire, though. There's no way this one gets this one gets decided by more than about two possessions. I'm going to take Texas at the end to go to the Elite Eight for the first time in 15 years. But the fact that they still won that Penn State game after mm-hmm. only hitting one three-pointer, and then they also won the Colgate game hitting 13 three-pointers. It shows that the offense like can win in multiple ways, facets of the game, like Robert's talking about, the mid-range, in the paint with Dylan DeSue, the floater game by Dylan DeSue. Yeah. Play. That's been crazy. And Xavier has these long defensive lapses that they'll go on and that we've seen in this tournament thus far. So I think I have Texas winning this one. Now let's jump forward to Saturday. Number nine, Florida Atlantic taking on number three, Kansas State, for a final fourth spot. What a matchup that is. Carter, who do you have in that game? Wait, Florida Atlantic for Kansas State? Yes. Okay, sorry. I got I, yeah. this, this place where we're going. <laughs> I got Kansas State. And Marquis Noel, he had uh, 20 points and 19 assists last night. I mean, an incredible a career-defining moment for him. I love the way Keontae Johnson's playing as well. And uh, Jerome Tang, what a job he's done as a first-year head coach. Kansas State keeps on rolling here. The crazy thing is Kansas State was bleeding a little bit down the stretch. TCU beat him by 13 um, in the Big 12 tournament in the first round. But Kansas State has rebounded uh, in a big way. I was impressed with the way they knocked off Michigan State. Tom Izzo is not an easy out in March. Uh, the Wildcats did that spectacular fashion last night. You mentioned Noel. Keontae Johnson, I think they have enough. Uh, to finally bring this Florida Atlantic Cinderella run to an end. Florida Atlantic to Memphis, maybe not elite. I don't think Tennessee is one of the elites. I think Kansas State is going to be probably by far the best team they've played in this tournament. I think that shows in this one. It's going to be close, though, but K-State comes through in the end. You know, okay, you said that you said Kansas State can bleed a lot with TCU. They are a vulnerable team. I know the Big 12 is very good in basketball, but I also follow, followed the Conference USA throughout the entire season a little bit. FAU stood at the top of their conference standings throughout the entire season. They played very well in conference. And I don't want to be someone who just picks a bunch of chalk mm. uh, like to go to the Elite Eight. And, and I feel like if someone's going to be uh, uh, upset another team tonight or th- in the Elite Eight, yeah. I think it is going to be FAU. I know we've seen 10 seeds go to the Final Four before. They're mm-hmm. not even a 10 seed, but we've seen seeds of that caliber make it to- all the way to that stage. And I know Kansas State, they're the vulnerable team from the Big 12. I think FAU is actually going to come up on top in this game because they've been playing great. Can you believe if that was Alabama's path, Princeton, the lead eight, Florida Atlantic in the, in the final four, it would be pretty crazy. Oh, All right, let's go, let's go quick on these uh, last five picks. We're a little bit low on time. We'll start at number four, UConn, number three, Gonzaga, and the other elite eight game. Robert, who do you have in that one? Okay. Uh, oh, I got to go with Gonzaga. After the way they played last night, you know, Mark Few's team, they come out They come out and they show up to play in March. No matter what seed they're going to be, one through five seed, Gonzaga knows how to play. You know, uh, Str- Strothern, yeah. Strothern can really shoot the ball. They have weapons. They know what they're doing. This is not anything new to Gonzaga. After last night and being Tom Izzo in March, can we, that's got to be one of the hardest uh, teams in their, in their run to the Final Four down the stretch. I mean, no one ever wants to play Tom Izzo. I'm, 
but it definitely put that put them ready to play a UConn team like this. I'm going with Gonzaga. Yeah, uh, I'm actually going to take UConn. This UConn's looked to control, looked to control against St. Mary's, looked to control against Arkansas. I just haven't been sold on Gonzaga. I think this was kind of a down year by Gonzaga. I'm honestly surprised they got by UCLA last night. So uh, give me a UConn team that's looked really good so far this tournament. I think they come out on top. Well, I was really high on UCLA. In fact, had them winning the championship in my personal bracket. Drew Timmy so impressive last night. I look for Gonzaga to keep on rolling. Now over the women's bracket. How about this? No one expected this matchup in the Sweet 16. Number eight, Ole Miss taking on number five, Louisville. Carter, who do you have in that one? Well, I think I have Louisville because Ole Ole Miss is riding way too high after defeating number one seed Stanford and you know Haley Van Leith 26 and 21 on efficient shooting in the tournament this year so give me the Cardinals on this one. Great pick I think Van Leith leads them in scoring. Louisville was dominant in the paint against Texas I think that will be another key. And how about their coach Jeff Wallace? He is intense he's gonna be coaching the heck out of these Cardinals I think they get by Ole Miss and go to the lead eight. Robert? Haley Van Leith great player she obviously Gave the work to Texas, but you know, Ole Miss plays in a very tough conference with teams like Tennessee and South Carolina. They also have a flat out better record than Louisville does. I just feel like Ole Miss is trained to play. They know how to play uh, teams that aren't in their conference that can actually show up and also play basketball. I think Ole Miss is just going to be prepared. I'm taking the upset in this one. I have Ole Miss. Let's go in the other women's uh, showdown. We're going to pick number three, Notre Dame, at uh, taking on number two, Maryland. This one, 10:30 uh, a.m. tip tomorrow. Robert, who do you have in that one? Yeah, I'm going with Maryland. I just the Terrapins, great team all around in the Big Ten. You know, Diamond Miller, 19.7 points per game, and she can definitely find ways to score beyond the perimeter, inside in the paint. She knows what she's doing. I have to take Maryland over the Fighting Irish in them I, in this game. I know that Notre Dame is a great women's basketball school. They're like practically a, a blue blood equivalent for women's basketball, right? South Carolina and Notre Dame. I mean, in recent years, yes, recent memory. Yeah. The Terrapins have, have a great, great uh, starting five led by Diamond Miller. I have to take. Maryland. I agree. Great pick. Diamond Miller, 24 in the win against Arizona in the second round. I think she comes up big. Uh, I think Terps keep rolling tomorrow morning. Maryland hit a buzzer beater on Notre Dame in the regular season this year. Notre Dame's got their top scorer, Olivia Miles, out. Maryland, two blowout victories. It's all says the Terps, baby. Now it's time to pick our national champions for each of the bracket. Uh, in the couple weeks ahead of time, obviously, these national championships will be next weekend. Uh, but let's go ahead and put our names, our reputations on the line. Robert, who do you have winning the women's bracket? I have to say true. I am a Longhorn, but I have to say true to my hometown. I know that I said Alabama was the most legit team in this tournament, but I'm going with the Houston Cougars. I'm going with them because they've played Alabama. They've played Alabama before. They did lose to them, but they know how to play Bama, and I think they are they are a legit team. They do get counted out by a lot of people, I believe, but Houston, they know how to play ball. They. They're, they are a basketball school. Houston's going to do what they're going to do, and uh, whether they end up playing Texas in, in the f uh, Final Four who kno or the Elite Eight, who knows, but it's going to be the Cougars. Robert, going a little bit of switcheroo on that one. You bring us your men's pick. So, Carter, what, what, what's your <laughs> men's pick? Oh, men, men. we'll, we'll, we'll stick with men's well, right now. Yeah, what you got? What you well, got? I, we said it earlier, Adam. I mean, look at the path that Alabama might have to the championship game here, and you talk about Brandon Miller, who's arguably the best player in this tournament. I got to go Alabama just because of their path, and I think the right side of that bracket is much more difficult than Alabama's side. So they're going to be in the championship game. Might as well pick them to win it as well. Bama was my pick before this all began. I'm going to stick with them. I just felt like they were the best team in college basketball. In a year where there's been a lot of parity, I felt like they were the best team coming into the tournament. The bracket shaped up nicely, and like you said, Brandon Miller getting back healthy at 19 against Maryland after not scoring at all in their first round game. Javon Quinterly, he added 22 in that one against Maryland. And, and like you said, I mean, they Bama could go uh, playing three mid-majors the next round if the, if the game shape out right. If Princeton wins, then you get Florida Atlantic winning. So I like Bama's path. I think Bama wins it. Uh, it's going to be fun. Texas Houston, that's going to be heck of a lead eight match with both those teams win. Oh, yeah. Now let's flip back to the women's. Let's end with that. Carter, what you got for that one? Caitlin Clark is perhaps the best player in women's college basketball. 26.8 points, 7 rebounds, 8.6 assists a game. I think she's been on fire in this March Madness tournament. Give me the Hawkeyes to win the women's bracket in the NCAA this year. You know what? South Carolina, they have won 40 games in a row. Dawn Staley, one of the best women's coaches ever, maybe if not of all time. 
It's been a weird, weird tournament. We've already seen two one seeds go down, but I think it ends in chalk. I think the Gamecocks get it done again. I think they keep that winning streak going and bring home their second straight national title. So I'm going chalk in that one. Robert, what do you think? You know, this South Carolina team, I know that in basketball, anyone can win in the NCAA tournament, but this South Carolina team kind of reminds me of the 2015 men's Kentucky team. Ooh. Where they just throughout the entire season were so dominant going to the fi- until they went to the final four and they lost to Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Clearly, everyone just saw them as an unbeatable team. I feel like right now for women's basketball, South Carolina is that really unbeatable team who just they're just so far ahead of everyone else. I have to go with the Gamecocks. Okay, so can you're, you're picking South Carolina to actually finish the job, unlike Kentucky I am. that year. Okay, it's going to be fun to watch. There's a bunch of great basketball coming up uh, over these next two weekends. Guys, great show today. A lot of good content. I know we'll all have our eyes on that Kansas City showdown tonight between Texas and Xavier. Shout out to Samantha Pearl, our faithful uh, TSCB sports director, for keeping everything uh, in check in master control. Uh, for Robert Gonson and Carter Yates, I'm Adam Ogburn. Have a great weekend and enjoy yourself some March Madness.